Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, let's go ahead and get started with this week's Grand Rounds. I'm uh, Chuck Gawad. I'm a member of the Grand Rounds Committee filling in for Dr. Leonard, who's out uh, this week. Um, so first of all, um, as usual, um, we have the text code to confirm attendance on the left-hand side there. Um, and then just a little overview of upcoming Grand Rounds. So today we have uh, Dr. Gruber talking about pediatric uh, AML. Um, and then next week, we'll have Dr. Dietz from Johns Hopkins discussing Marfan syndrome. Um, and then on the 28th, we'll be discussing the treatment of, uh, or uh, Dr. Rosen will be discussing the treatment of inflammatory bowel disease. Um, also a reminder um, that abstract deadline for the annual pediatrics retreat is this Sunday. Um, the retreat will be on the 29th of April. So uh, those uh, who would like to submit uh, just to note the deadline is on this Sunday. And then finally, uh, we have a save the date for the 41st annual perinatal potpourri advances in care. Um, that's going to be on March 24th and 25th. So this is just a, a save the date reminder, but uh, full details are, are going to follow. Um, so with that, it's uh, my uh, pleasure to introduce this week's speaker, uh, Dr. Tanya Gruber. Um, who's the Chief uh, of Pediatric Hemonc and Stem Cell Transplant, as well as Director of the Bass Center at Stanford. Um, so Tanya received her um, undergraduate degree from uh, the University of Washington, um, followed by her MD and PhD degrees from the University of Southern California. Um, she then stayed in Southern California for her pediatrics and pediatric hemonc clinical training at Children's Hospital of Los Angeles. Um, she then moved to join the faculty at St. Jude Children's Hospital in Memphis and quickly rose through the ranks um, and was subsequently recruited back here, back, or recruited back to California to Stanford, um, where she's now full professor and, and division chief. Um, her research programs really focused on uh, the genetics and treatment of high-risk childhood leukemias, um, with a particular focus uh, in infant acute lymphoblastic leukemia and acute myelogenous leukemia. Um, where her group has really made uh, fundamental important discoveries about the pathogenesis as well as uh, treatment response of those diseases. Um, and I think maybe most importantly, um, her, her group and, and, and her, with her leadership, um, they've been really one of the few groups who've been able to take fundamental discoveries in the lab um, and then take those discoveries to inform. And, and Tanya has led a, a couple of very large uh, multi-institutional treatment protocols um, that uh, uh, are making a difference in the outcome of, of our patients. And so uh, with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Tanya and uh, look forward to a, to a great Graham Rounds. Thanks, Chuck. Thanks so much for that um, lovely introduction. Uh, I'm really excited to talk to you guys today about pediatric AML, which is uh, a passion of mine. And um, and I'm going to share um, basically uh, data, not just from my laboratory, but from the laboratory of others to hopefully give you a comprehensive overview of how this disease evolves and um, uh, is, uh, occurs in, in children and uh, how we can hopefully uh, start to move towards better treatments in the future. So I have uh, the following disclosure. Um, I have uh, been consulting for Cura Oncology, uh, who uh, is developing a menin inhibitor for KMT2A rearranged disease. Uh, I will not be discussing that inhibitor at all today. So AML is actually very rare in children. It's the most common acute leukemia in adults. Uh, as you can see here, incidence of AML by age, that it really uh, increases with advancing age. And um, you'll see a little bit as to why that is uh, in subsequent slides. But in the pediatric setting, it's, it's quite rare. When you compare it to other subtypes of leukemia, on the left-hand side here, we're looking at leukemia rates in children and young adults. You can see uh, the frequency is much lower, AMLs in the yellow line here compared to the most common malignancy of childhood, which is ALL, uh, the malignancy of um, lymphoid cells in the green line here. 
Yeah. Term ALL is really the poster child of how pediat pediatric oncologists have managed to improve outcomes to the extent where um, they now reach greater than 90% overall survival for these patients um, on the whole. However, you can see here for acute myeloid leukemia, there's a significant outcome discrepancy, 63.9% uh, overall survival. Um, while this is older data, the data has not changed. Uh, and that's one of the great frustrations for those of us uh, in the field is that outcomes have really been stagnant uh, for the past 20 years. This disease arises from your bone marrow. Um, from and, and the way that happens is within your bone marrow, which is making all of your blood cells, um, there are, uh, there's a hierarchy uh, of progenitor cells. So you start with your pluripotent stem cell that can give rise to all the different blood cells, and it becomes progressively more differentiated um, with multipotent progenitors. Uh, then you have a subset of common myeloid progenitors. Um, and what happens is these different progenitor compartments um, can acquire mutations. Now, the cell of origin of acute myeloid leukemia is unlikely to be limited to a specific sub compartment, progenitor compartment. So it's not as if, for example, all AMLs arrive from the MPP compartment. Uh, and because of this, uh, you see some uh, variation in terms of how these cells look phenotypically under the microscope uh, and how they look at the gene transcriptional level. Uh, which we'll talk about um, more. Transformation is a stepwise process with most patients having more than one mutation and a variable latency between acquisition of the first mutation and subsequent hits with full transformation. But there are exceptions. We have sequenced pediatric AML cases that have very few mutations and in some cases only one mutation. In general, when that happens, that particular mutation um, as a result of a structural variation that has led to the fusion of two genes in what we often refer to as a fusion oncogene. And an example of that would be a KMT2A uh, fusion. So we've learned a lot about the process of transformation in myeloid cells through studies that have been done in adults. Uh, and a more recent discovery um, was the existence of something that's called clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential. And essentially the way this was discovered is through all of these sequencing efforts, it was noted that seemingly healthy individuals had sometimes very low level um, uh, frequencies of mutations that are commonly associated with uh, myeloid disease. And the frequency in which we, you see that in the population increases with increasing age. So by the time you reach 60 years plus, in some studies, the frequency of, of individuals walking around um, that have a so-called mutation that's been associated with myeloid malignancies can be as high as 30%. And when you look at when this begins, they've actually found individuals uh, in their late 20s uh, who have very low levels of AML uh, mutations in their blood. And so what's happening here is the bone marrow has acquired a mutation that has conferred um, an advantage in terms of growth. And so you get that clone uh, of that progenitor that has acquired that mutation, which sort of starts to grow out and, um, and take up more of the marrow than it would without the mutation. And so you can imagine if that clone then acquires additional mutations, that's going to continue to change that cell's behavior. Um, and if that mutation is uh, something that promotes transformation, that you could then lead to a state of dysplasia. And that's exactly what you see in myelodysplastic syndrome. And then again, if you continue this trend with additional mutations, you can develop a full-blown malignancy of AML. And that's really what this figure is donating, that through successive mutation acquisition, you then ultimately get transformation. And so if you have clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential, which we often uh, refer to as CHIP, uh, 
at 60 years of age, you can imagine the chances of you developing malignancy are higher. And, they, and studies have shown that they are. And if you then progress to MDS, the chances of you getting AML are even higher. And that's, I think, one the reason we see this increasing incidence of AML um, over the lifespan. What about pediatrics? Well, we do have examples of this exact phenomenon happening in pediatrics. The time frame is much shorter. Uh, so this was a beautiful study that just came out um, uh, this past fall um, from Marson, uh, who's now at St. Jude. And he's very interested in myelodysplastic syndrome in pediatrics. It's very rare, um, but it does happen. And in many of these cases, these patients actually have that initial mutation in their germline DNA, meaning they've um, inherited it and it's present in all of the cells in their body. Uh, and one of those examples is a gene called SAMD9. Uh, and you're looking here at uh, patients with SAMD9 mutations in their germline. Uh, and it's showing you sort of when they identify these patients um, and the, the, those patients go on to develop um, um, dysplasia in their bone marrow, uh, what those additional mutations are that promote that phenotype. Uh, so you can see there's a variety of them. And this is just showing you the time frame in which evolution is happening in these patients where you have your initial SAMD9 mutation in turquoise here. And you can see um, at diagnosis, the presence of a very small subclone uh, that also has a set BP1 mutation. Uh, and then within a couple months, within two months, uh, an additional mutation is identified at a very low frequency in ASXL1, which is a mutation associated with myeloid malignancies. However, that clone uh, essentially extinguished. But you can see this clone that's acquired set BP1 has now begun to grow out. And within 19 months, it's the, now the predominant clone. And you can see here now additional clones popping up. Uh, so this is essentially a recapitulation of what we see in the adult setting, but in a very short time frame. So when you compare the mutations that we see in myelodysplastic syndromes, in AML, in CHIP, there's a lot of mutations that are overlapping. Um, and however, uh, you can, this is showing you just essentially um, uh, the, the degree of overlapping between uh, the types of mutations you see in all of these different disorders of the bone marrow. Uh, there are distinct mutations found in AML that are unique to AML um, and are not found in myelodysplastic syndrome or uh, CHIP. Uh, many of these mutations tend to be the chromosomal rearrangements that cause fusion oncogenes, which have such strong transformation potential that um, there is no slow acquisition of mutations. The transformation is essentially expedited because that oncogene is so strong. So uh, for treatment of pediatric AML, it's actually very straightforward. Uh, so it's one of the easiest um, treatment approaches to get a grasp of as you're going through your training in contrast to ALL, which is very, very complex. Uh, all regimens are based on anthracyclines and cytarabine, and a subset of patients go on to get transplant. The chemotherapy, um, as many of you know from rotating on the wards, is very myelosuppressive and leads to prolonged periods of pancytopenia. And during that time, the patients are very susceptible uh, to infections. And when we look at the uh, outcomes of AML patients to date, the improvements have been a result of supportive care and incorporation of an, a test we call minimal residual disease, which detects how much leukemia is left in the bone marrow after successive chemotherapy rounds and risk stratification. Uh, and they, the improvements haven't really been a result of uh, changes in the chemotherapy that we're administering. There are a couple of small exceptions, which I'll talk about later in terms of targeted agents, which have made uh, a difference in a subset of patients. Uh, this is showing you outcomes from the uh, St. Jude series of AML trials. And uh, prior to the initiation of uh, antibiotic prophylaxis and aggressive treat uh, uh, management of infectious complications, the outcomes for these patients were roughly 23% event-free survival. And here we define an event as either death or relapse. Uh, 
Um, and you can see after initiating antibiotics, uh, we've improved outcome uh, event-free survival to about 45%. And then we implicated, or, or sorry, implemented um, risk stratification, both at the genomic level and at the minimal residual disease level. And that improved things uh, at EFS to about 62 uh, to 63%. And we've actually really stagnated at that point. Um, and you can see here that the AML02 study ended in, in 2008. Uh, so we're now going on 20 plus years where we haven't budged this far. Um, this is uh, data just to support the use of stem cell transplant in these patients. Um, it's data, uh, it's, it's a beautiful study. It's data from the adult cohorts. A subset of these studies actually had younger individuals um, on protocol, for example, the MRC AML10 um, has uh, younger patients on that. But it, it's one of the best analyses to date that shows the, um, um, how stem cell can improve outcomes in a subset of patients. And, and one of the nicest studies to show that it's not true for all patients. The benefit um, in this study was really limited to intermediate and high-risk patients. So if you look here at the hazard ratio of relapse or death, um, so-called good risk AML patients that had favorable uh, mutation, um, uh, mutational events didn't benefit from transplant. And so you don't want to give them transplant. You really want to just give them chemotherapy because you're, by, if you transplant them, you're just adding on toxicity with no benefit. In contrast, there was a benefit in the adult cohort for intermediate risk and poor risk um, patients. And that's by, <clears throat> as I mentioned, what type of mutational status they have, which I'll discuss more. Um, and <clears throat> I hope to convince you by the end of today's talk that not all intermediate risk patients will benefit from transplant and that we really need to do a better job of risk stratifying our so-called intermediate risk patients. So just to show you how much of an impact risk stratification can make, um, this is a data, data from AML02, which was the first study to use minimal residual disease um, as a risk stratification method. And so with MRD, essentially what we're doing is we're taking a sample of the bone marrow and we're looking by flow cytometry to see how much residual leukemia is there. Now flow cytometry assesses the proteins on the surface of the cells and as you can imagine, many of the patients with AML have proteins on the surface that are also expressed on normal blood cells. So there's a panel of proteins that we look at, and uh, essentially we're looking at the combination of those proteins. And uh, through a lot of uh, work prior to implementing this, we've been able to establish what is an abnormal profile and what is a normal profile. But that distinction is not as good in AML as it is in ALL. So the sensitivity of this assay is less uh, than it is in ALL. And essentially what we use uh, cl for clinical decision-making is 0.1% uh, disease at the end of the second cycle of chemo. Uh, and the reason we do this is because of this study. So the graphs you're looking at here is the incidence, cumulative incidence of relapse. Induction one is one cycle of chemotherapy. Uh, and if you look here, uh, less than 0.1% uh, residual disease after one cycle of chemo, the relapse rate is very low compared to patients that have greater than that. Uh, and so can you tease it down further? Uh, well, after one cycle of chemo, if you look at uh, disease levels between 0.1 and 1%, no, that doesn't add any benefit. However, if after two cycles of chemotherapy, you then implement uh, this point, um, uh, this uh, 0.1 to 1%, then you can start to tease out that in fact, these patients do do poorly. Uh, however, that level of disease is not predictive after one cycle. So we have, we basically make decisions regarding transplant based on how much disease you have at the end of the first and the second. So if you have greater than 1% after the first cycle, we know that the relapse rate is high for those patients and transplants recommended. After the second cycle, if you have greater than 
uh, persistent disease, then again, those are patients um, that we feel will benefit from transplant. And so it's recommended that they proceed with that. So here uh, we've sort of, I've sort of hopefully um, conveyed to you that we group our patients uh, into risks. High risk patients uh, go on to receive stem cell transplant and then low and intermediate risk patients continue to receive chemotherapy. Uh, and we'll talk about how we can improve this. Uh, moving forward. And to do this, we're, we'll turn from residual disease to what is the contribution or how do patients with different types of mutations fare in terms of chemotherapy alone or chemotherapy with transplant. And this has been going on long before next generation sequencing has happened. A uh, very active field uh, in cytogenetics, um, which really pioneered, first of all, the discovery of many oncogenes. Um, going back, you know, many, many years, um, beginning with Janet Raleigh, who's one of the investigators who first identified structural aberrations. Um, and through successive studies, uh, they've been able to identify uh, structural variations that actually lead to uh, mutations that are causing leukemia. And there have been, it used to be you could get a beautiful high impact paper just by cloning. Uh, what these genes were that were involved in that structural rearrangement and showing that uh, it was a fusion uh, gene. Uh, and so I'm showing you a list of some of these and the details um, are not that critical, but through studies, we've learned about certain mutations that are favorable, uh, some that are intermediate, meaning we're not sure how, how high risk patients these are, and then adverse. Uh, and this is data from a, a 2012 consensus paper in pediatric AML. Um, and these are genomic lesions that we currently use in risk stratification. Uh, and the question is, can we make this better now that we have next generation sequencing where we understand the entire spectrum and mutations that we see in these patients? Can that improve risk stratification? Can we identify new biologic subtypes? And if we study those subtypes in the laboratory, can we understand how the mutations cause the the disease and identify uh, new therapeutic targets. This was the first genomic, uh, I shouldn't say, it's the first uh, study in genomic study in pediatric AML that was comprehensive in terms of all of the different subtypes uh, that were involved in the cohort of patients studied. And so this is done, uh, this is the target initiative, which was led by the Children's Oncology Group. And what they did is they said, okay, let's take uh, AML samples from patients that have been enrolled on our studies, and let's include all the different subtypes that we know of. Uh, thing, uh, cases that have structural variations such as core binding factor leukemias, KMT2A rearranged fusion genes, uh, and, and, and so on. And we'll look at them and we'll look at uh, what additional mutations they have to try and understand how uh, these uh, cases cooperate with other mutations. And then we'll also look at a subset of cases that don't have structural rearrangements to try to understand what's drawing them. And then they went further and they compared it to what we knew about adult AML at the genomic level. And there was a very clear message in this paper, which I think is very important, is that pediatric AML, um, although shares many uh, attributes to adult AML, it does not equal adult AML. And at the genomic level, we really have a different flavor of mutations. And so uh, the colors here on the bars on the left indicate the proportion of patients that have a specific fusion oncogene. And, you, and in gray and black, you're looking at patients that either have cytogenetics that don't reveal a clear oncogene or have totally normal cytogenetics. And you can see here that the frequency of fusion oncogenes decreases with increasing age. So these fusions are really something characteristic of pediatric disease um, and as opposed to adult disease. But even if you look at the mutations not that, that are not fusion oncogenes, um, and so these are mutations that are um, uh, found with, in cases that have fusions, but also cases that have normal cytogenetics. Um, you, what we see is that the types of mutations, there, there is overlap. But there are some unique attributes to pediatrics and some unique attributes to adults. Uh, 
So the classic adult mutation that's seen in a high proportion of patients is DNMT3A. It's almost never found in pediatrics. Less than 2% of patients will have this, but it's a major uh, driver of malignancy in the adult setting. It's also a mutation that you find in clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential. In contrast, we can see here NRAS has a very high frequency uh, of um, mutations in the pediatric disease, and it's not as common uh, in the adult setting. So, and, and here in the middle is an example of a shared mutation with equal frequency in both cohorts, and that's the FLT3 internal tandem duplication. So it's important to remember um, that while there we see shared mutations, we also see unique aspects between pediatric and adult disease. And so for these companies that are developing targeted sequencing panels and um, assays, you know, you look at them, many of them are actually geared towards adult disease and don't cover the important genomic events that we see in pediatric AML. So just to summarize uh, the, the, the strength of this study and point out a, a potential weakness, uh, there were 815 patients profiled, which is a huge cohort. It's unbelievable, fantastic. Um, they weren't all uh, profiled with the same degree of sequencing. Uh, so 197 received whole genome sequencing. And with whole genome, you can really detect every type of lesion. Uh, a subset of the 850 patients just had targeted sequencing um, to look at recurrency. Um, of those that received comprehensive whole genome, about half of them carried one of three oncogenic fusion genes, which are well known to, to, in the literature. Um, and so what that means is you don't have as many cases um, that, that lack a major fusion gene. Um, and when we looked at the cohort overall, um, there were only 10 mutations that occurred in more than 5% subjects. And all of them had been previously described. So our question was, because of the way this study is designed, are they missing rare subtypes of pediatric AML? And can we sort of tease those out? So what we did is we identified we pediatric AML cases. We excluded those that had one of these major fusion genes. We also excluded uh, a, ca a category called FABM7 or megakaryoblastic leukemia because we had intensively sequenced it in a prior study. And we were left with 122 cases of normal and complex karyotype. Um, so these are the gray and black uh, bars um, in the previous uh, slide. And then we uh, conducted whole genome, exome, and RNA sequencing so that we would comprehensively characterize them. And then we combine that data with the published data sets. So now we have a big cohort of comprehensively sequenced pediatric AML patients. We brought back our megakaryoblastic leukemia patients, uh, the target cohort, uh, the pediatric target cohort here. And then we also brought in two subtypes of disease that have myeloid features, one of which is pediatric uh, mixed phenotype acute leukemia, these are leukemias that have myeloid and lymphoid features, and then a pediatric early T-cell precursor leukemia, which is a, a T-cell malignancy that also has myeloid features. Uh, and then we integrated everything um, to look at gene expression, mutation status, and outcomes uh, for discovery. So this is what it looks like uh, at the transcriptional state. So if every dot on this graph on the left is an individual patient sample, and we're just coloring them according to what flow cytometry tells us. Does flow tell us, um, is this purely myeloid? Are there T cell markers? Is it megakaryoblastic? Is it undifferentiated? Uh, and while most of the cases um, clustered according to flow, about 10% of cases associated with alternative immune phenotypes. What does that mean? We did not see, for example, the mixed phenotype leukemias all clustering together. You can see the reds are scattered throughout, and we even have cases where there's a couple of reds in a sea of uh, AML cases. Um, and we, when we then overlay, okay, what types of mutations do these patients have? There was a strong association with the different transcriptional states with the mutation they have. And that's really what you would expect. 
So if you go back to uh, the example I mentioned about uh, the mixed phenotype cases in this MK1 cluster, what, what caused them to cluster there is the fact that they carried a CEBP alpha mutation. Now, in mixed phenotype acute leukemia, the vast majority of physicians will initiate treatment with lymphoid-directed therapy. But we know that myeloid um, AML with CEBP alpha, that these patients have excellent outcomes with AML-directed therapy. And so that brings to question, if you have a mixed phenotype case with a classic AML mutation at the transcriptional level associates with AML cases with this mutation, should you be treating them with lymphoid-directed therapy because of cell surface proteins that can be up or down regulated uh, in a Barrett manner? There were, but there are obviously exceptions where the mutation uh, pattern was mixed. Uh, and so these two clusters uh, are highlighted here where you can see different colors which are donating different types of mutations and they were very mixed bags. And that's where we really focused in um, on our analyses. And I'm gonna start with the cluster up at the top. So this is a cluster that was comprised of all of the early T cell precursor cases, the one, uh, one of the acute undifferentiated cases, a significant number of mixed phenotype cases, all of which had uh, T lineage and myeloid uh, lineage antigens on their cell surface, and then a subset of AML cases. Um, we, one of the first things we did was verify by gene expression that the flow cytometry assessment of their lineage status was correct. Um, and that was true. Um, we're looking, for example, here at CD3 epsilon, uh, this is a T lineage marker, and you can see in the ETP and mixed phenotype cases where we saw T lineage characteristics on the cell surface that it's high there compared to the AML. We designated this cluster as AMTL based on a paper from uh, Alex Kentis and Alejandro Gutierrez, and they postulated that there was the existence of an acute leukemia with shared myeloid and T lineage features. And I want to talk a little bit about that paper um, because I think it's, it's very beautiful in the way that they looked at the data that had been published to date and postulated that this entity existed um, so that by the time we came along and we saw this, it was very apparent to us that this was, uh, we felt, um, the subtype that they were describing. So they proposed a, that this was a distinct uh, subtype of acute leukemia divided across three diagnostic categories owing to the variable expression of markers deemed to be defining of myeloid and T lymphoid lineages, such as MPO and MP3. Uh, the data they uh, uh, put forth in this manuscript uh, or opinion piece to support the entity was that there is retained myeloid differentiation potential during early T lymphoid development. Also, there's the recognition that some cases of AML harbor hallmarks of T cell development, such as T cell receptor gene rearrangements. And furthermore, um, in some of the descriptions of T lineage patients and myeloid patients, there are common gene mutations in subsets. Um, and some of these genes include WT1, PHF6, ROX1, and BCL11B. This is showing you um, that argument regarding the differentiation potential of cells. So you're looking uh, again at hematopoiesis uh, in the bone marrow, uh, limiting it to T cell differentiation. And you're starting with your stem cell on the left here and successive differentiation into T cell restricted cells. And uh, in the red here, it's showing you the subsets that retain myeloid potential. So you can still get myeloid cells developed from these precursors and at what point they become T cell restricted. So if you have mutations acquired by a progenitor cell that has T lineage and myeloid lineage potential, then that would be one way in which you could get this type of leukemia. Conversely, if you have a T lineage um, uh, restricted progenitor, but you acquire a mutation that can cause the cell to actually become, uh, lose that T lineage commitment and become in a way less differentiated, then that would be another way to achieve this uh, population. An example of that would be RUNX1. And then there are also mutations that promote a T cell phenotype such as NOTCH. Uh, and you can imagine if you acquired that in a multipotent progenitor, uh, 
that that would then again promote this type of population. So these were the three reported uh, purported um, ways in which they um, felt that this malignancy could develop. So we looked then at the mutational comp composition of this subset and we were seeing um, exactly what uh, had been previously described in terms of the spectrum of mutations. We were seeing mutations in WT1 and PHF6 um, and BCL11B, and these mutations were occurring in the AML cases um, and in the ETP cases and in the mixed phenotype cases. When we look closer at the transcription, you start to see potentially some delineation of two different subgroups. And at the mutational level, what we found is that one of these subgroups here was dominated by mutations in FLIC3 internal tandem duplications, and the second in um, one of three genes that's part of a protein complex called PRC2. And when we looked at outcomes of these patients, we saw that within this group, there appeared to be two different outcomes that correlated with the type of mutation that was present in the patients, with the FLIC3 internal tandem duplication patients doing extremely well, and the PRC2 mutant patients doing very poorly. Uh, and so we wanted to look further at that uh, because within these AMTL patients that were had FLIC3 mutations that were doing very well, there were a couple of them that also carried mutations in WT1. This combination of mutations is very well known. And historically in the literature, uh, pediatric patients with this type of mutational spectrum have done very poorly. So that didn't really make a lot of sense to us. But when we looked back at our cohort, what we found is that there were also FLT3 internal tandem duplication with WT1 mutations in another group of patients down here at the bottom. And so, when we compared outcomes of patients with this exact genomic profile between the two transcriptional states, we also saw a huge difference in outcome. So the same oncogenic mutations, but very different outcomes and different gene expression profiles. And this is where you see really bad outcomes with these patients when they cluster with this group, um, which we call mixed karyotype um, uh, cluster five. So why, how, first of all, how can you have the same mutations and have totally different transcriptional states? Uh, so one of the first things you do is you look and see what's differentially expressed. And when we looked at what was differentially expressed, the top genes were dominated by Hox genes. And so we went back to what was known about hematopoietic progenitors and Hox expression within those progenitors. And we used an existing data set. This is something we call a spring plot. So you're doing single cell sequencing and each dot is an individual cell. Uh, they're sequencing normal bone marrow uh, and you're looking at the most pluripotent cell at the top in blue. And as you go down, cells are becoming uh, more differentiated into different progenitor subsets. And what we saw is that when we looked at FLT3 WT1 leukemias, those that clustered um, in cluster five um, that had uh, the poor outcomes, with the high Hox expression, looked to be uh, closer uh, or more like stem cells and common myeloid progenitors um, when you looked at the Hox gene locus in contrast to the FLT3 WT1 cases that were in the AMTL cluster. Um, and you can see here, as you have increasing lymphoid potential, that you're starting to downregulate many of these Hox genes. So what we then did is said, okay, we're just looking at a handful of Hox genes. What if we look at the entire transcriptional profile of stem cells and we say, what does this leukemia cell most likely resemble when you look at all of the genes? Uh, and so if you see here the cluster five uh, cases that had a poor prognosis, they had a greater enrichment for the stem cell signature or the common myelate progenitor signature, but a lower um, enrichment for the lymphoid progenitor um, uh, gene expression profile in contrast to the AMTL cases, which were enriched for lymphoid progenitors. Uh, and can you do this uh, in a less complex manner? Yes, you can. We looked at the ability of a score called leukemia stem cell score um, at, to predict um, how stem cell-like these cases were and whether that would then correlate um, outcome. 
And you can see here that the patients in cluster five that had a poor outcome had a much higher leukemia stem cell score compared to uh, the patients that clustered in the AMTL group. We wanted to see if this was the case for another type of mutation. So we looked at KMT2A rearrangements. These patients occurred in two different clusters, one cluster which was pure in terms of the mutation, and so they all carried KMT2A. Then there are also cases that occurred in this cluster five. Uh, and what we found is indeed, if you compare the outcomes of these two types, that the patients in cluster five did poorly compared to those that were in the KMT2A cluster. And that if you look at their leukemia stem cell score, uh, there's a much higher stem cell score uh, in these cluster five leukemias compared to uh, the other KMT2A cases. So then we decided to expand this analysis across the entire cohort because we wanted to understand, can we start to delineate um, how stem cell-like a given a patient's leukemia is, and can we use this prognostically? Uh, so we go back to our normal data set of uh, stem cell progenitors, and the first thing we did is say, okay, let's calculate the stem cell score in these just to make sure that this score is truly valid. And interestingly, this had not been done even though the score had been published. Uh, and actually it worked beautifully. Uh, so you can see here the stem cell, cell, the most pluripotent stem cells had the highest stem cell core, uh, score and the score lowered as you became more and more differentiated. And so based on the normal data set, we set up thresholds of low, intermediate and high stem cell scores. And then we looked at outcomes across the cohort and you can see that those patients with higher scores have inferior outcomes compared to patients with low scores and this is independent of oncogene status, um, et cetera. And so now if we go back to our TSNE plot where we're looking at the entire cohort, you can look at how stem cell scores are across the entire cohort and uh, it's unevenly distributed. So we felt that there was the potential for this to be an independent prognostic feature. And so we went back and we looked for association of outcomes with the different types of features of a leukemia, what type of mutation they have, what's their transcriptional identity, how high is their leukemia stem cell score. Um, and you can see here uh, what significance of uh, 05 is the dotted line. And with the exception of immunophenotype, which doesn't predict outcome at all, um, the, each of these factors individually associates with outcome but your best association occurs when you include all of these factors. And so can, could we implement this into our pediatric trials to really understand which patients should be going to transplant and which patients should not be going to transplant? What we did is we, we applied the AML-16, which is an ongoing study, that genomic classification uh, to our cohort and looked at uh, relapse-free survival. Uh, and as you would expect, low risk patients uh, did the best, uh, intermediate risk fared less well, and then the high risk had very poor outcomes. Within the data set we were working with, it was roughly a third of each type. Then if we implement uh, the proposed classification where we look at oncogenic driver, stem cell score, transcriptional identity, then what we found is that we were identifying a lot of patients that we would deem as high risk because either they have uh, very high stem cell scores or uh, for example, their FLT3 WT1s that fall in the MK5 cluster or MLLs that fall in the MK5 cluster. And you can see all of a sudden half of those patients uh, we would label as high risk uh, and they're doing very poorly and your intermediate risk population shrinks and those that are left have much better outcomes. So this suggests that the proposed risk stratification is superior um, in terms of predicting relapse. And then we went on to do a bunch of statistics to prove that was true. And we went on to look at it in an independent cohort uh, to validate the results, uh, which did validate. So I think this is the model I want you to take home and uh, I, I don't think this is a new, conceptually a new model in the field, but what, I, what we would argue is that this is a model we can use 
uh, in our risk stratification of patients in the future. So you have a cell of origin, which could be one of many types of progenitors. It acquires an oncogenic mutation, uh, and that contributes to the transcriptional profile of the cell, but also the cell of origin provides a uh, contribution to that transcriptional state and really uh, drives how stem cell-like uh, that given leukemia may be, and that all of these are measurable and can be used uh, in terms of predicting relapse uh, and then actionable, of course, in terms of referring patients to transplant. So I don't have a lot of time yet, but I wanna briefly discuss um, future uh, treatment directions because I think we're reaching a point where, um, yes, we'll keep working on risk stratification, but that's gonna plateau as well. And so we have to think about how can we improve the treatment that we're giving these patients and not just uh, work towards identifying exactly who needs transplant and who doesn't. Um, so uh, briefly, I'll go over a couple of things. The targeted drugs, which are now uh, have now been implemented, FLT3 inhibitors, CD33 monoclonal antibodies, the ongoing prospective trials, um, that are looking essentially at liposomal formulations and epigenetic priming, and then finally immunotherapy, uh, which I think is really um, the major buzz uh, in the field of pediatric oncology. So first, uh, FLT3 inhibition. So I discussed uh, subsets of patients that have FLT3 mutations. This is, uh, FLT3 is a receptor and it initiates a signaling cascade that leads to proliferation and malignant transformation. We have a number of drugs that can target the FLT3 receptor. Uh, and uh, so when that aberrant signaling is happening, shut it down. Uh, the most data in pediatrics is with a drug called serafinib um, that has the ability to inhibit the internal tandem duplication mutations, which are really the most frequent FLT3 mutations we see in pediatrics. And uh, the COG, we've been actually using it in, in studies uh, therapeutic studies for a while, but the COG was the first to do a randomization with serafinib, which is the gold standard. And uh, they're beginning to uh, publish early results uh, from this study. And what they're finding is that just having a FLT3 internal tandem duplication doesn't necessarily mean you're going to benefit from this inhibition. Uh, so if you look here at the top, uh, we're focusing in again on the patients that have the internal TAM duplication with the WT1 mutation. Uh, so you can see here in the blue, um, patients that get serafinib um, have done quite well on that study. And those in the red are the ones that did not receive serafinib and they have a very poor outcome. And this is what I meant when I told you that in the literature, these patients historically do very poorly. So if you were to hand me these samples, I would tell you, they're probably all in this MK5 cluster. If you uh, gave me a specimen, I could tell you the sequencing. Um, but that goes to show you how with a subset of patients that adding this FLT3 inhibitor can be beneficial. But then there were patients that did not benefit. So you look here down in the bottom at the patients that have FLT3 mutations with the NUP98 NSD1 fusion oncogene. Whether or not they got serafinib, it didn't matter. Their outcomes were equally dismal. And that's because the fusion is mainly driving this cancer and it doesn't need FLT3. So you can inhibit it all you want, but it can maintain the malignancy all on its own. And so these are important lessons to learn because you don't wanna add another drug to combination chemotherapy and increase the side effect profile um, if it's not gonna be a benefit to the patients. And I think this is something that we have to also convince our families. So initially when we launched the AML-16 trial, we limited FLT3, the FLT3 inhibitor serafinib to the very high risk patients. Nonetheless, families who found out that their child had a FLT3 mutation who weren't deemed to receive the serafinib uh, basically dropped out of study because they wanted the drug. Uh, and so I think these randomization studies, separating it out by types of mutations are so, so critical. Uh, and these are really studies that can only be done by the COG because of the huge numbers they have. Uh, so this is a very important contribution they're making to the field. Uh, what about CD33-directed therapy? Um, we have a drug called gemtuzumab. Uh, we sometimes refer to it as GO or Mylotard. And what this is, um, I'm showing you here on the right, 
It's essentially an antibody that recognizes CD33 protein on the surface and attached to that antibody are toxins. So the antibodies infused into the blood, it binds CD33 positive cells, it's internalized, the toxins released and the cell is killed. Now, normal myeloid cells also express CD33. Uh, so you're killing not just leukemia cells, you're also killing normal myeloid cells. Um, however, the most primitive stem cells are spared. And that's why this treatment is feasible because you're not wiping out your entire bone marrow for good. Um, the COG has done studies to look at the benefit. Um, it's actually, um, pretty mild, uh, but they're deeming it a success. So if you look at these p-values, um, we're looking at survival probability. They're, they're including both overall and event-free survival uh, in these curves, um, and then uh, go versus no-go. Uh, and what you can see is there's no real benefit in overall survival. Um, however, if you look at the event-free survival, so relapse-free survival, um, you start to tease out a difference with the p-value of 0.04. Um, and I think this is another scenario where we could do better. We could look at who exactly is benefiting uh, from this treatment. How high is the CD33 expression? What is the genomic profile? Um, and uh, nonetheless, um, the COG is incorporating GO for all patients up front uh, based on this data. So the ongoing uh, prospective trials, I'm listing three of the major ones. Uh, the uh, UK, United Kingdom is very active in the AML field. They've been leaders for many, many years. They have a protocol called UK My Child that's comparing uh, liposomal formulations to non-liposomal. Um, and uh, they're also comparing uh, myeloablative uh, versus reduced intensive conditioning for patients that go on for transplant. So what I really love about the UK studies is they're big proponents of randomization. Uh, and that really is very, can be very informative. Uh, and so from every study that's been done, we always learn something. Uh, the COG uh, study uh, is also looking at liposomal formulations. It's also a randomized study. Uh, and then the study that we have open here is the St. Jude AML16 study, which is looking if DNA methyltransferase inhibitors given prior to chemotherapy blocks can, can um, uh, prime cells to be more sensitive to chemotherapy? Can it disrupt uh, the leukemia program that's occurring as a result of the mutations? Uh, and, and essentially, it's really a pilot study to look at tolerability. Is there a clinical signal that we see? Uh, and then there's a lot of correlative studies to understand what happens to the cells when you give these epigenetic agents because the idea is the more you learn biologically, the more you can uh, do in the future in terms of uh, understanding the biology. And then I wanna briefly finish with immunotherapy. Uh, so AML has long been known to be immunoresponsive, which is highlighted by the beautiful graft versus leukemia effects, which we see uh, in patients following stem cell transplant. But it has also been demonstrated uh, to be immunosuppressive and immune evasive uh, in the patient. Uh, and this figure here on the right is showing you some of the pathways that have been elucidated um, to suppress the immune sy system. And it's not important to understand uh, each of these individuals for, you, for, for the purpose of this uh, seminar, but just to understand that there are multiple pathways through which AML can inhibit the immune system. Uh, and so that shows you uh, the great feat of an allo stem cell transplant where those donor T cells are overcoming uh, the AML's uh, ability to evade the immune system. And what about CAR T cells, which are really all the rage in B cell malignancies, FDA approved for pediatric ALL, it was the first FDA indication was in the pediatric setting. What about AML? Uh, so how CAR Ts work, as many of you know, when you rotate on the wards, uh, we take T cells from patients, we engineer them to recognize uh, a protein on the surface of a leukemia cell. Uh, the most um, common one is CD19. Uh, and what happens is uh, the way the T cells are engineered, it's shown here on the right, um, you have a um, external part of, uh, which is essentially almost like an antibody to recognize that antigen. And then the internal um, part of this protein has a co-stimulatory 
uh, domains. And so when the, the T cell binds the tumor cell at the antigen, uh, that signal is turned on and the T cell becomes activated and actually kills the tumor cell. So in B cell malignancies, the B cell antigens are targeted by the CAR T leading to B cell aplasia because CD19 is expressed on normal B cells. That's what we call an on-target toxicity. It's a side effect that we know is going to happen and we expect it to happen. Now, B cell aplasia is tolerable for a certain period of time. Uh, we can support patients with antibody infusions. Uh, however, if you target myeloid antigens, you're gonna get pancytopenia and you can't tolerate pancytopenia for six plus months. Uh, and so, the thought going into these studies is that CAR T cell trials targeting myeloid antigens may not be definitive. If we can get a great CAR T cell, it, it very likely is gonna kill a lot of normal myeloid cells. And it may be that we need to use that as a mechanism to get them into remission, but then transplant them so that they can have some normal mineral function. Uh, the studies open are targeting uh, the following proteins, CD123, CLL1, CD33. The vast majority are in the adult setting. However, there are a subset of pediatric studies. Um, but also in the field, they're also looking to uh, avoid on target long-term on-target toxicity. Uh, and so a way to do that uh, is through the development of bispecific antibodies, which I don't really have time to talk about today. Um, but there is a CD123 by specific antibody trial uh, that's open in pediatrics. Um, and so I think um, we'll, the field will get there, um, but we're much more behind. Uh, and I think the issue of targeting external myeloid antigens um, is, is a formidable issue uh, that we need to uh, get around. So just to conclude, pediatric AML is a rare malignancy uh, with a poor prognosis. It arises from myeloid progenitors that acquire mutations. Uh, these mutations occur in oncogenes and tumor suppressors. And in younger patients, we see a high preponderance of fusion oncogenes from structural alterations. The supportive care and risk stratification have been major factors to date, which have improved outcomes. FLT3 and CD33 antibodies are targeted agents, which benefit a subset of patients. And immunotherapy studies, including CAR-T, are under investigation. However, antigen selection is a challenge. And then I'll end there. And I'm just going to, for the sake of time, show my gratitude. I do want to mention, in particular, Martin Fornerad, my collaborator, who um, uh, together um, led the, the um, sequencing study that we published this past fall. Yeah, <clears throat> great talk, Tanya. Um, uh, we, so we have time for just a couple questions. Um, but so the first question is uh, regarding the KMT2A rearranged leukemias, was stemness associated with any particular fusion partner? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, it wasn't, but our sample size was low, and so we don't have a lot of power. Um, and, and that's having like a huge cohort. Uh, so I think what will be really important as we treat these patients, I, I, I really feel like everybody should be sequenced. I know you and I agree on that. And as we accumulate more and more data, I think, you know, it's possible we may tease those things out. Yeah, great. Um, <clears throat> so David Lewis uh, wrote wonderful talk. Any consideration for drugs that would decrease stemness as a therapy in combination with other drugs? That's a great point. So in a subtype of AML called APL, we do use drugs that promote differentiation. And that's one of the um, uh, sort of things that people, I think get people really excited. An example where that has essentially failed has been the DOT1L inhibitors for MLL, where they saw patients getting these inhibitors and it promoted differentiation. But the second you took the drug away, the patients relapsed. And so that suggested that a subset were not dying and becoming apoptotic as they were differentiating. So I think it's important not just to induce differentiation, but to make sure that those cells undergo apoptosis. But yes, there's a lot of interest and a lot of people in the lab are looking at compounds that promote differentiation. That's a great question. Well, great. So uh, we're right, right at time. So uh, thanks again, Tanya, for, for a great talk. And we look forward to seeing everyone back here next week. Thank you.
The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.